Thank you, Dr. Ribel, and I know that every person in the room would join me in thanking you and your team for putting on what has been a wonderful conference so far. It is my great pleasure to introduce you all to one of the most interesting and engaging and the brightest people in state government today, and we are very lucky to have Dr. Robert Mace, who is Deputy Executive Administrator at the Texas Water Development Board. There he manages the Water Science and Conservation Program. This is a group of 66 really bright people that study the rivers, the aquifers of the state and promote conservation of the state's water and pursue innovative uh, solutions and technologies such as desalination, rainwater collection, and reuse. Robert has a BS and MS in hydrology from New Mexico State of Mining and Technology, and he received his PhD in hydrogeology here at the University of Texas. We, I've known Robert for many years. He has 20 years of experience in water management in Texas. He's authored or co-authored more than 200 reports and abstracts, and he's given hundreds of speeches on water, and I know that you will uh, join me today in welcoming him and uh, enjoying very much what he has to say. Mr. Robert, Dr. Robert Mace. Okay, let me get my timer set up because once I get going on water, it's hard to stop me. <laughs> Uh, first off, I just wanted to, to say how impressed I am with, uh, with the conference. Um, and uh, just the, the presenters, fantastic, and, and, and the audience as well. I mean, there are a lot of movers and shakers of Texas water in the room. The questions have been fabulous, the give and take. And, uh, and so again, you know, round of applause for the organizers of the conference. Oftentimes when I uh, you know, speak at an event that's just a couple blocks from my office, it's hard to get away, but I cleared my schedule. You know, especially when I saw that Todd Votler was talking. I have to keep an eye on him. Um, and then also, this is a wonderful place to have a conference. I love coming over here um, in large part because the food is so good. Um, if, if I was invited to speak at a conference on the mating routines of three-legged gerbils, I would be here for lunch. I'm telling you, it's well worth it. Um, a lot of dry talks this morning, and uh, mine is, is more of the same. Obviously, the, the drought is the, the topic du jour. As you've heard, we've had improvements in parts of Texas, but the drought rages on um, in West Texas, South Texas, and Far West Texas. And one thing, one lesson I took from the drought last year, being on the front lines, working closely with, with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and Texas Department of Emergency Management and other state agencies, is all it takes is one Texas community to struggle with its water supply to reflect poorly on Texas as a whole. Just one, doesn't matter how, how small it is, um, it's going to make the, the papers, it's gonna be in the local papers, the state papers, the national press, and even the international press. And it creates the storyline that, that Texas doesn't have enough water. Um, and so, I want, want you all to keep that in mind. It, it really does impact all of us, whether we're in business, uh, in, in, in research, or whatever we're doing with Texas, that uh, just having one community struggle um, can, uh, can be rough for the entire state. What I want to talk to you all today is, is uh, kind of a, about water supplies. Um, and uh, I'm down to talking about surface water and groundwater freshwater supplies. But really, it goes beyond that in terms of diversifying Texas water portfolio. And I want to talk about you know, what happens when the big one hits. And you know, these plots of Texas here show the drought um, you know, back when we started in good times in uh, October of 2010. And then uh, um, latter parts of last year where it was you know, really the worst that we've seen since this map started being put together and then we've seen some recovery. Hopefully we'll continue to see some recovery but then we'll start entering our typical dry season and so don't be surprised if you see the map darken up again in the future. Uh, you've, you've heard a number of, of folks this morning talk about this as being the worst one-year drought on record, uh, the driest period on record, the hottest period on record. 
I don't know about you, but I was very pleased when we broke the, uh, you know, over, um, broke the record for number of days over 100 degrees. I was really bummed in 2009 when we missed it by one day. We blew past it last year. Um, I'll let the next generation, or would prefer the next generation to break that record, so I don't see, see a summer like that again. Statewide reservoir storage, the lowest since 1978 at uh, less than 60%. That has a very uneven distribution across the state. A lot of reservoirs at uh, you know, just horribly low levels in West Texas. Um, huge ag losses, lots of wildfires, and first-time first calls on, on a number of the state's rivers. And Todd Votler mentioned this, but given as bad as the drought was last year, and, and oftentimes I'd cringe when I'd seen the papers that that was, that was an, a drought of record, the worst drought Texas has ever seen, because reality, the, the worst drought the state has seen for most of the state is the drought of the 1950s. And uh, you know, again, picture last year with five, six, maybe as many, 10 years, depending on, where at, on the state, of dry years preceding last year. That's the drought of the record, and, and that's the drought that uh, you know, keeps me up at night and keeps the water planters in the room up at night. Um, that drought led to the creation of the agency I work for today, the Texas Water Development Board. And we've been, been challenged and determined to ensure that there's security for the, the future of uh, Texas water supply. Um, and uh, this is a Palmer Drought Severity Index, and it's just another way to help put in perspective the drought of last year in, into uh, context of the drought of the 1950s. So that red blotch, that's the drought of the 1950s compared to what we've had. And even going back, Earlier last century, you see some, some more severe droughts, uh, just in terms of, of um, uh, length or duration than we've seen um, in the last year. Now again, that drought of the 1950s led to the creation of our agency and then ultimately led to the, uh, state water planning. And there's been a number of these state water plannings. You heard that in 1997, in response to a pretty severe drought in 96, uh, it was re-engineered with a more of a grassroots or ground up planning with regional water planning. And uh, we've had three plans come out of that process, the 2002 plan, 2007 plan, and this past January, the 2012 state water plan. I'm um, not going to go into the gory details of this plan, but um, but I do want to show you a couple plots. The uh, On the horizontal is time going forward in decades, and we're currently in the 2010 decade. Um, and then we've got the uh, acre feet. Um, the solid line there is the water we have now. It's the water we have with our current reservoirs, our current wells, our current infrastructure, current water reuse plants. And you see that line going down with time. Um, in part, that's due to um, the um, drainage of the Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, because we're pumping that aquifer at, at uh, more than 6 million acre-feet a year. It's only being recharged about 1 million acre-feet a year. And, uh, you know, if you run your banking account like that, you know, kind of know what happens. And then also, um, sedimentation of the state's reservoirs is also um, impacting that water supply. Um, we've got a group of, of folks that, that go out and measure, uh, do bathymetric surveys of reservoirs, and based on the information, we figure that we lose about 90,000 acre feet a year from sedimentation coming into our reservoirs. Uh, and so even, even reservoirs aren't necessarily um, a sustainable supply. At some point, you know, we're going to have to deal with the sedimentation issue. The dotted line up there is our demand. And uh, as was noted um, last night by uh, Chairman Strama, um, you know, it goes up 22-some uh, percent while our population goes up 80-some percent. Um, in part, that demand is, uh, doesn't go up at, at quite the rate because, in large part, because we see a decrease in use in the Ogallala Aquifer in the agricultural sector because the water is just simply not there. But nonetheless, that water demand is going up. Ideally, um, and, and I should note that that water we have now is based on a repeat of the drought of the 50s, and that water demand is based on a repeat of the drought of the 50s, and so ideally, we want that dotted line to be below that solid line, and we are not. So answer that question, no, we're not ready for the next drought of record. Statewide, there are, there are communities and, and individual water suppliers that are certainly ready, have worked very hard to make sure they're ready, but statewide, we're, we're just we're not ready. Now the good news is, is the water plan um, 
has a plan, has a, a list of projects and, and things that we could do that could help us um, ensure that we have enough water, particularly for municipal supplies. Um, you heard this morning that the agricultural sector often gets hit really hard during drought and, and oftentimes there's not much that we can do for them. Uh, they need very inexpensive water and it just doesn't money out to build uh, infrastructure to, to help, help those folks. And so they just pretty much just have to ride out the, uh, the climate, ride out the, uh, the drought. Um, you can see we've got other surface water up there as a big chunk. Uh, a lot of that is just simply renewing contracts or connecting infrastructure to, to existing water, whether it's run of river or it's a, a reservoir that's been built in the past due to the foresight of uh, some of our forefathers, but we haven't connected into it yet. Um, also, new major reservoirs, 17% is, is a large uh, part of our projected supply. Conservation constitutes a large part of where we think our future water supply is gonna come from. Uh, irrigation conservation, municipal conservation, as well as water reuse. Uh, a big component of where we think our water is going to come from. All those are green. Some people consider those all conservation. Some, some argue about water reuse. But ultimately, that's about using our existing water resources more efficiently. And that's a sizable chunk of our water future. Uh, groundwater is still expected to be an important source of supply. And then we're seeing um, a growing interest in desalination, uh, conjunctive use, and, and other uh, strategies for meeting water. Um, the other thing to consider, and, and, and uh, this was alluded to this morning, uh, Todd Votler, is that um, we've, had, uh, we've had a drought of the 50s as compared to the drought we had last year, but then also you can look at tree rings and get a sense for how much worse the droughts have been in the past. And this is a tree ring data that goes back to 1300. Anything below that zero that's colored in red is drought. On the far right-hand side, you can see the drought of the 50s, and then you can go back in time and... Uh, and see that there have indeed been worse droughts in the past. Um, so regardless of, of your, your viewpoints of uh, you know, human forced climate change or what might happen with the future, we can look in the past and see that we've had worse droughts. And with the drought last year, and, uh, and myself personally getting a real bad feeling about it, started asking myself the question of well, what happens if we get into a drought worse than the drought of record? Um, and you know, what would we do as Texas? if we got into a drought worse than the drought of record. Now one place that's been looking at, um, at this issue and living in real time is Australia. Uh, they, they've suffered uh, large parts of it, a, a decade long drought, uh, far worse than anything they've seen. Parts of the country are still suffering from that drought and they've had to react uh, almost in an emergency type basis, which of course makes things very expensive. Um, Israel, who is, um, um, I mean, arguably always in drought. In fact, some folks would argue West Texas and far West Texas is always in drought. But uh, Israel is also interesting in terms of how they're dealing with their water security. And of course, they're dealing with some political things as well. And then as I think about you know, who's, who's been having to deal with this, um, El Paso has, uh, has also been dealing with this. Um, you know, to a certain degree, they're dealing with the situation now in terms of uh, responding to you know, perpetual droughts or, or greater propensity for dry years. And then you could even throw in West Texas, uh, dealing with drought that you could argue is worse than the drought of record. This is a hydrograph showing Lake Meredith. And uh, you know, about 2000, the rains pretty much stopped, or, or really the, uh, the inflows of the reservoirs pretty much stopped. And we've seen um, the reservoirs go down with time um, until essentially the conservation storage is zero. There's still a little bit of water out there. I guess you could canoe on it if you wanted to. Um, so one thing that, that I get and, and my staff gets from looking at what Australia, Israel, what El Paso, what the um, Canadian River Municipal Water Authority, which are the folks dealing with Lake Meredith, what the Colorado River Municipal Water District are doing is, is a diversification of their water portfolio. So just like your financial portfolio, you know, if you've got a financial advisor that told you to put all your retirements into in funds into Facebook, you probably ought to fire that individual. <laughs> Although it might work out, I, I didn't see what it's doing today. Um, but you wanna, have your, you wanna have your portfolio diversified and, uh, and similar with water. You, if, if you have a diversified portfolio, you're distributing the risk more. And so if something doesn't pan out over here, 
then, then you're hopeful that things will pan out over in a, in a different part of your por portfolio. And so just looking at the lessons learned from, from those folks I listed, um, you know, advanced water conservation is key. Um, you know, having uh, the dual flush toilets, I don't know if anybody used the facilities here, but they have dual flush toilets here, at least they do in the men's restroom. I didn't check the women's out. Um, the, uh, that lower photograph there is showing uh, you know, condensate. Uh, the uh, super tall, actually the tallest building in downtown Austin, the Austonian condo development, they, uh, they originally were gonna put rainwater harvesting there to, to water the plants on site. And they hired a rainwater harvesting expert to come in and, and, uh, and he took a look, you know, there's not a whole lot of roof area on a, on a um, skyscraper, you know, it's mostly up and down. And, uh, but he did some calculations and said, man, you could collect a lot more water from, from condensate. And so that's what they do there. And you can do that at your own household as well uh, and, and use that water for, for a beneficial purpose instead of just running out and evaporating. Um, photo on the left there is a, a, a toilet you can actually buy. Um, this is kind of like more of a local water reuse where you, uh, you wash your hands um, in that basin on top and then that drain water goes into your tank which you then use the next time you flush your toilet. Um, there's other ways that you can use local water reuse to, to conserve your water supply. Um, some discussion this morning about rainwater harvesting. Um, I'm a big advocate of rainwater harvesting because I believe it changes your DNA about water. There's a, <laughs> you know, it's, there's something about, it just develops this personal relationship with your water. You're capturing it, it's yours. You know, you watch it closely. Um, the, uh, the only time I've, I've bawled in the last 10 years is when I left the faucet on one night and came out the next morning, it was drained dry. Um, you know, it was just very upsetting. But that can help conserve water. And, and the way my wife and I used this water was to, to take the, um, uh, or replace outdoor watering with rainwater wa harvesting, or rainwater, which, you know, the plant, quite frankly, the plants like it better. Um, it's fun, you know, I highly recommend it. You can check it out. Um, and folks would say it doesn't rain during a drought, and certainly last year was, was, uh, was rough. You know, the tank, tank went dry early. Um, but it does often, rains come and go during a drought. Even that drought of the 50s, rains came and went, so you could collect that water and, and use it. Um, Robert Puente showed the increase in water use in San Antonio. And that, that's really where the, you know, the big benefit can come in is, is uh, using water efficiently outside. This is a, a lady in the west side of Austin who let her lawn die and painted polka dots all over it. I, I think it's quite beautiful. I'd recommend that you all do that as well, is rainwater <laughs> harvesting. Um, studies show that that uh, saves quite a bit of water from, uh, from irrigation. But seriously, just, just people irrigating more efficiently if they're going to have a yard or considering xeriscaping, um, or, or minimizing, quite simply, the amount of turf that's, uh, that's out there. And uh, I'm a big fan of the Wildflower Center, and uh, they're, they're promoting a, a new grass that's natives that, that they, they said can uh, claim that can go dormant for, for uh, up to six weeks without any watering. And so we're gonna look at that for our place um, to, to try and minimize. Water reuse, um, this is something, I should say in, in Australia, when they went into their mega drought, I mean, they banned all outdoor watering, um, unless you had uh, you know, some local water reuse, uh, gray water recycling, or you had rainwater harvesting. And in, 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 uh, my understanding in Israel, you're not allowed to use it for anything outdoors. You know, if you're collecting rainwater and things like that, you need to be using it um, um, for your house. Um, and so, you know, when it comes down to, do you want, water for drinking and you want water for your, your lawn, hopefully you all want water for drinking. Another thing that happened in, uh, in all of these communities and including far west Texas and west Texas is water reuse. Um, basically taking that water instead of putting it back in the river, treating it and using it for, for alternative uh, uh, purposes. In Texas we have something called indirect reuse which is uh, um, some ways you could call it accidental reuse where we take that treated water, we put it in the river flows downstream to Houston, and then Houston uses it. Um, I read a, a, a number saying that 40% 40, 40 of Houston's water supply uh, comes from treated wastewater. It comes out of Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, this is a place where the, the medicine part of Tamis might come in because there's some um, concerns about micro-contaminants. And so um, uh, medications, pharmaceuticals, 
can show up in the water, uh, caffeine, uh, antidepressants, um, and uh, even Viagra can show up in the, the in very low levels. It uh, gives a whole new meaning to the term a stiff drink, but <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is why they didn't want me talking during lunch. Um, but using, but then there's also directory use where you take that water and you, and you use it as, as uh, Robert Puente showed this morning for um, um, Microsoft or using it for Toyota. Um, but there's also, you know, there's a water cycle and if, if you're taking water and using it for something else, it's not going someplace else. And so there are environmental flow concerns about that water not going back into the river or even water right concerns where that water's not going back into the river and someone downstream is relying on it. Um, I think you'll see uh, more transfer of water from uh, agricultural to municipal. And uh, we see that in some parts, particularly Lower Rio Grande Valley, as it's just exploding down there in growth. It's just simply eating up the agricultural land. And so that's just naturally um, converting that, say naturally, but converting that, those water rights into municipal water rights. And to a certain degree, some of that's happening um, in the San Antonio area. But as the cities get you know, continue to grow and get thirstier, they're going to be reaching out looking for additional water. Um, this is a plot I stole from San Antonio Water System, but aquifer storage or recovery. Um, taking water um, from, from an one source that's uh, potentially fickle, you know, whether it's surface water or, or, uh, or the Edwards aquifer, and putting it in some place that's more stable, like a, a sandstone aquifer. And uh, you know, there's some plans for more of that in, in the water plan. I was just at a conference in California, and the Californians are all over this, just in terms of putting, whether it's treated wastewater or treated surface water down into their aquifers, either to replace what's been removed or to help uh, um, you know, take, take the uh, variations out of their water supply. Um, Seawater desalination, you heard already about brackish groundwater. There's a lot of it across the state that's distributed. Um, that can be um, uh, much more affordably desalted than, uh, than seawater. But we're also fortunate in Texas that we do have the Gulf of Mexico. Right now, it's, it's very expensive. Uh, Laguna Madre Water District is uh, um, seriously uh, looking like they're going to build uh, probably what would be the first plant in a very long time on the Texas coast for the water supply. Um, in, in really long-term drought situations, I think you probably see seawater being looked at. In fact, there's some folks looking at seawater now because of what happened with the drought last year and the flows in our rivers. Um, I talked about reuse already, but, but Texas is, is uh, starting to get in the forefront of direct potable reuse. And uh, several projects, one is um, with the um, um, Colorado River Municipal Water District. They're going to take their reuse water, they're going to advance treat it, so they're going to run it through a reverse osmosis system, and then they're going to put it into their water supply pipeline from their reservoirs, run it back to their tr treatment plant, treat it, and put it into the drinking water system. Um, that's, uh, that, that would put Texas um, at the front in the United States for doing that. Um, <clears throat> the city of Brownwood, who has also struggled with drought, is looking at doing that same thing, but putting the water directly back into the drinking system. Um, and uh, my understanding there's only one other place in the world that does that, in, uh, in Namibia, Africa. And so that, that becomes a source of water. Um, certainly if we go into a drought worse than the drought of record, we're going to see more of that, uh, that direct reuse. And then groundwater, which um, Ron Kaiser mentioned um, College Station having a drought independent supply, and that's one of the uh, powers of groundwater. Not all groundwater, because karst aquifers, limestone aquifers like the Edwards are certainly susceptible to drought, but many of our aquifers in Texas are relatively independent of what's going on with the climate, uh, at least directly independent. Of course, they respond to increased pumping. But um, um, in a really severe long-term drought, groundwater can become a, a, a very important supply in, in uh, you know, replacing, temporarily replacing uh, surface water. Um, and in fact, conjunctive use, which is really using your diversified water portfolio to its greatest benefit, is, uh, is something that we'll see more and more. The, the Canadian River Municipal Water Authority, they were there to manage surface water resources out of Lake Meredith. Um, as their reservoir levels went down, they started having salinity problems. And so 
They pursued groundwater, fresher groundwater to deal with salinity, water quality issues. Um, but then as the reservoir continued to go down, they've now become almost 100% uh, dependent on groundwater. Uh, I imagine that when, the, as John Nielsen Gammon said, the rains will come back, they'll get some water in that reservoir again, they'll switch over from um, non-sustainable groundwater pumping to surface water. Um, El Paso does this uh, very expertly in terms of how they manage their diversified water portfolio. Um, this, is a, this is a plot, the North American Water and Power Alliance. This is a plan hatched in 1965 to bring water from Sarah Palin land and uh, um, Canada all the way across the uh, United States, including Texas, and even supplementing flow in the Rio Grande. I put this up as a, as a well, first it's kind of cool, and uh, <laughs> I'm not proposing that this is what we should do, but as a reminder, and this was, this was talked about already this morning, about the need to, to move water from where it is to where it's needed. Um, and you know, the, the cities in Texas, the economic engines are growing such that you know, they've, they've used up their local supplies and they're going to have to be able to reach out and bring in resources. And so you know, all of us working together need to, to find the equitable ways to, to make that happen in order to ensure that we have water uh, security for the future. And uh, unless you think that those big dreams of moving water across continents are an old-timey thing, this is a study from Lawrence Livermore National Labs, 2009, to bring water from the Mississippi River. Um, across Texas and a number of other states. So, you know, some folks are thinking about this. Again, I'm not proposing that. Um, personally, I like this, this approach here. The <laughs> um, but it's, it's got to be, uh, debate whether I should say, it's got to be non-Texas beer, otherwise it's Texas water, but Texas beer tastes pretty good, so it'd be hard for me to give up Shiner Bach and Lone Star. Um, message I want to leave you with, uh, particularly to the scientists and the uh, medical professionals and the engineers that are in the crowd, is, is in academia there's a lot of work done on advancing the technology, advancing the science, advancing the understanding. Um, me and my guys on the front line, you know, what we're struggling with is convincing folks that this is the way to go in terms of advanced technologies. And so, one thing I want to leave you with and challenge you all with is, is there's a real need for that technology transfer, for bringing um, everybody at the table that uh, you know, would see benefit from research in terms of uh, how it impacts their water supply, you know, whether it's a new technology or, well, there I am up there. <laughs> that kind of scared me. <laughs> you won't look at me, I notice, you know, you won't. <laughs> um, so, so I want to challenge the scientists and the engineers and the academics out there that, that when, you, when you work on, on your research and advancing things, it's, it's critically important to get it out there to where it gets employed. And uh, you know, whether, whether you do that on your own or work with, with Water Development Board or other state agencies, uh, that, that's a key critical part. And then finally, um, you know, water gets defined as uh, often as a universal solvent. You know, it'll dissolve everything given enough time. Um, it's also uh, a universal uh, uniter, I think, because we're all connected by water. And just the folks that I've met this morning, you know, we've got the scientists, um, we've got the folks that are in medicine, we've got the, the engineers, we've got the money folks that are here, the attorneys, the policy makers, um, to, to citizens. You know, we're all in this together, and, and we're all going to rise, you know, increasing our water supply will rise or raise all boats. You know, we're all going to uh, um, do better if, if our water supply for Texas is secure. And water is also intimate. You know, it's not only handled by the highest levels of policy, you know, down to the state agencies, but also each and every one of us deals with water every day, and we make choices in terms of how we use water that has an impact on our water supplies. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Is time for questions? Or? Time for some questions? There's supposed to be a microphone wandering around. Oh, I see one. Oh, that's the microphone. <laughs> oh, there's a question over here. There's one right.
It's, uh, it's, it's bloody expensive to dredge reservoirs. And in fact, it'd be less expensive to build a new reservoir than to, than to dredge one out. Um, you know, it's very uh, labor intensive in terms of all the, whoops, all the scooping you've got to do. And then also, oftentimes, there's uh, some nasty stuff in the, those sediments that, that uh, you know, have to be carefully disposed of or, or thought carefully about to make sure um, you know, it doesn't get back into, this, into the stream and, and causes some issues. Good question. The question is, is, is what are the largest obstacles to getting the water plan enacted? Um, in, in part, I guess there's lots of, lots of obstacles. You know, money is a big one. Uh, you know, it's, it's expensive to get that certainty to get us through a drought of record. And, and water providers have a real challenge in convincing ratepayers or, or the politicians and then the ratepayers that this is worth the cost to do this. Um, there, there's also challenges, and depending on what strategy you're using, um, it's, it can be difficult to permit projects, um, you know, including both the state and the federal level. So surface reservoirs have to struggle with that. Um, and, then, uh, and then also, I guess, having people realize that, that this is an issue. Uh, I think a lot of Texans take it for granted the water comes out of the faucet. And, um, and so, um, I think a lot of folks don't don't understand perhaps that there's you know there really is a problem and that we, we could be risking not having enough water if we get into a truly serious drought. Question is 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 it time to redefine the drought of record? Um, you know, our agency is, uh, you know, we're going to follow the law, and the law says the drought of record. Um, my, my personal opinion is that even when you look at tree rings, the drought of the 50s is a pretty bad drought. I mean, it's, it was a pretty epic drought. Have there been worse droughts in the past? Yes. Is, are there possibilities of worse droughts in the future? Yes. Uh, regional water planning groups have the ability to plan for droughts worse than the drought of record. Um, through um, um, certain assumptions on safe yields. And so if, if a planning group is concerned about that, they can certainly do that, and some of them have done that. Um, and then also, stepping back and look at the big picture, we're not, we're not ready now for a repeat of the drought of record. Um, and so uh, it'd be good to be ready for a repeat of the drought of record um, before uh, law change to plan for something worse than a drought of record. And the other thing is, as you increase your reliability, the costs go up dramatically. And so can you imagine planning for a drought of the 1100s and it looked like it lasted decades long? Um, but I think in part it is useful to, to look and go through the, the uh, thinking over, well, what, you know, what would we do if we got into a situation like that? And in part, that's why you know, I've, I've looked at you know, what's Australia done, because they found themselves in that situation. And in a broad sense, I think Texas is set up well. We've got access to seawater if we, if we needed it. Um, there could be water swapping done there. And we're also very fortunate to have a lot of fresh and groundwater that, uh, that we can tap into to get through a you know, truly epic drought. Question is, is, is now that there's, there's a recovery from the drought of 2011 for much of the state, does that tend to make uh, uh, decision makers and, and uh, constituents uh, apathetic? Yes, we call it the, uh, you know, there's the hydrologic cycle, there's also the hydroelogic cycle, where, <laughs> where it rains, people get apathetic, they don't think there's a problem anymore, and then you know, the, drought, the next drought is always around the corner. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, even, even myself, I mean, I know what you know, the situation that we're in with, with implementing the water plan, you know, seeing the drought map getting better, I mean, it just, it just feels better, you know. It, um, but uh, but that, that, is a, that is a concern. And there's, you know, there's always somebody out there saying, well, we don't need to do anything because it'll rain again. You know, it'll rain. It's just the question is, is it going to rain at the right time before we run out of water? All right, with that, Robert.
Thank you. Good.